Hello everyone, my name is Parisa Tarek and you're watching DBTV Exclusive. Considering the recent boom in technology owing to the growth of the internet, there's a lot of buzz around where Pakistan stands in the global digital economy. Today we have with us one of the most influential names in the Pakistani tech industry. Yusuf Hussain is a tech entrepreneur, angel investor and tech enthusiast. He is the CEO of Ignite National Technology Fund and has had international experience in startups, funding, offshore development, internet marketing, and internet business models. Yusuf, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. Now, let's start with the digital skills program. You've played a major role in designing that program. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what the program aims to do right now and in the long run? Yes, first of all, uh, this was an idea of the IT minister and the board, and uh, then Ignite designed this program. So we can say that the shorter term goal over the next three or so years is to train one million people online with coaches on intermediary and basic digital skills so that they can become employable as freelancers and in other occupations. The longer term uh, goal is to create an infrastructure, to create a platform where people can undertake uh, learning throughout their lives because that is the world we are headed to. Uh, it's a fast changing world, skills and demand keep changing and therefore people need to train themselves in newer skills and they need to demonstrate initiative and creativity in planning their own careers. So this is a platform uh, which we hope will enable that to build that cadre of future workers and also a platform which can leverage some technologies we expect down the road like artificial intelligence or virtual reality in deepening that training experience. Okay, now Ms. Anusha Rahman has stressed extensively on wanting to empower women through the DG Skills program. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how uh, this program targets de gender disparity in the tech industry? Yes, first of all, um, because this program is online, it's about around 100 the cost of other such programs. But the problem, the key challenge with online programs is course completion. To address this course completion issue, we have online coaches who help students through emails and through phone calls and messaging. And then we've got an, a data analytics artificial intelligence capacity, which is looking at what's happening in terms of who is engaging, when are they engaging, when are they dropping off, and then playing with things like Urdu English balance of courses, live versus animation, which skills are earning money, the coaches to trainee ratio, and the outreach program, digital versus electronic, what's working, to keep improving the program. Now, because people can take this course on laptops or computers or their smartphones or tablets from their home or any other secure location, this uh, has a great impact on women who want to be trained in digital skills because many women, particularly in rural areas, uh, even in uh, towns and cities, have certain challenges in traveling from home to their workplaces. So now they can stay at home in secure locations and avail of this. Okay, now since DG Skills aims to promote freelancing opportunities, are there any mechanisms that have been put in place uh, to ensure that freelancers connect with client businesses? Uh, in fact, that's a core competence that the course will impart. The freelancing module will do just that. How to build your profile, how to find the right opportunities, how to position yourself for those opportunities, how to build up your profiles, remain engaged. That is actually the intent of the freelancing course. But one thing I'd like to point out is, it's just not about uh, international freelancing. Uh, it is also about local freelancing opp opportunities which are coming up. And it's also about local employment. Uh, so they're, they're all these things. And um, in freelancing as well, there are certain skills in demand at any given time. It's a moving goalpost. And the idea is to train in those particular skills which may be going up in demand while other skills are going down in demand. Okay. How would you say that the state of Pakistan is working towards energizing innovation value chains from the grassroots level? Well, when we talk about uh, grassroots level, uh, maybe that's one kind of metaphor is grassroots and another metaphor is cradle. 
right? Yes. Because grassroots can also be interpreted to mean that how early do we start in the life cycle of, of a person? Exactly. So uh, what that requires is, uh, and this is a challenge all over the world, uh, is that we do not stifle curiosity in children in school. Because uh, education systems tend to do that, uh, industrial age education systems, because the whole industrial age paradigm was factories where supervisors are telling you what to do, and the same thing got reflected in school systems where teachers are telling you what to learn, rather than following your own curiosity, which later in life becomes creativity, and later in life becomes initiative, which are the skills required for the future of work. Because repetitive tasks, rote learned tasks, are getting replaced by artificial intelligence, mm. and a repetitive physical tasks by robots. So at the grassroots level or the cradle, uh, uh, we need programs which do not stifle curiosity. Uh, and Makers Fest is a global movement which fosters creativity uh, among children. Makers Fest, you are making whatever, woodwork, uh, clothing designs, Internet of Things, electronics, and so on. What we are doing at Ignite to foster that is that we have a program which is teaching STEM or science, technology, engineering, math to, to high school students. Uh, again through blended learning, again through a much lower cost, and again with quantified outcomes. In this case, about a 23% increase in, uh, uh, in federal board science results. So we are ramping that, that up to about 70,000 students now. So that is kind of the beginning of the value chain. Then in terms of innovation uh, at the college level, or university level, what we do is that we fund final year projects. And final year projects are a, are a practical manifestation of innovation and technology. And uh, we funded about 1,400, uh, uh, 1,400 uh, projects to date, and we're increasing that number now going forward. And then uh, the, the, when we come next in the value chain is incubators. And we've just rolled out five incubators, uh, three incubators in the last uh, one year, and another two in about three months. So we feel that this nationwide network, which will host about 200 startups at any given time, will be, uh, in, in our mind, a great fill-up uh, to the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Okay, but now in addition to um, promoting curiosity, do you think that the government of Pakistan uh, should inculcate digital skills programs at uh, primary school level curriculums? Yes, I definitely believe so. Uh, number one, uh, if you look at the big picture, we need to get out of school children into school. By the way, we are looking at one program, again, from an innovative perspective, being scaled up to do that, uh, so that these children are taught to read and write. And then, insofar as in-school children are concerned, A, we need to uh, not stifle their curiosity and promote it through Makers Fest, and number two, we need to teach them these STEM skills. And part of these STEM skills are programming skills, because when you learn programming, you also learn structured thinking or what is called computational thinking. Uh, because programming, if you learn programming, it's not just that you can be a programmer later on in life, it also builds your analytical skills, which can be used in any other vocation as well. And the Ministry of IT, again, uh, this was a program of the minister, uh, they trained about 100,000 girls uh, in middle school, six, seven grades, in uh, battle malls and government schools. Mm. And my, this was a Microsoft, a program Microsoft helped with. Microsoft trained the teachers and the teachers then instructed the, the girls. So definitely, I think, I, I hope that over the next five years, this programs such as these will be ramped up across the country. And uh, secondly, we'll be able to bring more of these out-of-school children back into school. OK. So smartphones have allowed a very deep penetration of technology. Uh, but despite that, a large chunk of the, uh, of the population of Pakistan is still isolated from the internet. Now, does DigiSkills plan on um, addressing that issue as well? Uh, excellent question. A short answer, no. Because that is somebody else's mandate. That is a mandate of another uh, organization within the uh, ministry or administered by the ministry, which is called the Universal Service Fund. And the Universal Service Fund rolls out this uh, 3G, 4G to remote parts of the country where otherwise it's not available. And I believe their plan is, their plan is that by the end of calendar 2018, every village in Pakistan with a population of more than 100 will have access uh, to 3G, 4G, and in some cases to what we call 2G. 
Okay, but don't you feel that because of this, DG Skills is only targeted at a select group of privileged uh, people who already have access to these uh, facilities? Uh, no, I, I don't feel that at all. Okay. And the reason is that, uh, uh, like I said, if, uh, I mean, Pakistan, the, the poverty rate uh, or, or, the, or the number of people earning less than $5 a day is about 50% of the population or 100 million people. Out of these 100 million people, uh, I, I would guess that approximately uh, 80 million people or, or even if it's 60 million people who, are ac uh, who can access 3G, 4G or 2G, uh, they are accessible. And we also see that the number of smartphones has now exceeded 70 million. Uh, so th th these people are also underprivileged. And if we can, uh, at least in phase one, uh, provide these uh, intermediate basic school to one million out of these people uh, with 70 million smartphones, let's say, or, or the 50 plus million growing all the time with access to the internet, I think that'd be a great beginning. And then we can expand the program. Uh, and we can, for example, I'll tell you that Ignite is funding a project for uh, ultra high altitude drones to provide internet to real remote locations. Mm -hmm. So by that time, if something that, like that comes around and we are able to provide uh, this internet access in remote locations where uh, you don't even have roads uh, and you don't even have schools and we can provide it through these high altitude drones, then we can, in a second phase, address them as well. But if in the beginning you bite off too big a chunk and you try to do too much, you end up failing on every front. So we got to establish a basic thing that we get good completion rates on our online courses, that these people start earning money and we have to tinker around with things, we have to experiment mm. to make sure that happens. And once that happens, then we can expand more. So okay. I think that's the way to execute rather than being too idealistic and then failing. Okay. Now, considering the focus that DigiSkills is uh, laying on freelancing, how would you say the digital market and the shared economy will contribute towards tech growth in Pakistan? Well, first of all, uh, you know, some people uh, always say that Fiverr or Upwork has blocked Pakistan accounts or, you know, it's, it's hard to get, there's always competition. But the reality is that the long-term trend, if you look at the next 5, 10, 25 years, it is towards something the World Economic Forum chairman, Dr. Klaus Schwab, calls the gig economy or, or, or the human cloud. And because uh, in this rapid change in competition, companies uh, don't like to take on the, the overhead of long-term or permanent employees. They like to be agile in the face of change. And you get agility by carving off tasks and giving tasks to uh, people or outsourced firms around the world through the human cloud or through the gig economy. So this, uh, by all forecasts, this, uh, this is only going to rise, uh, you know, first of all. So this is uh, this is basically uh, you know this is basically the the target that we are setting. Uh, you can call it I, I don't know if you would call it a shared economy as such. Uh, shared economy is more about uh, sharing uh, your car or your house or your tools or maybe your time or uh, even blood. Uh, there's a company doing that, but but this is more about a human cloud. This is more about uh, marketplaces for uh, tasks. Okay, now with that said, uh, do you think that uh, the Pakistani tech industry right now is contributing substantially to its exports? Uh, or should I rather say that are the applications and softwares and other tech products that we're producing, are they up to international standards at the moment? Well, um, I would say that uh, the IT industry, uh, uh, we don't have precise figures, but uh, it's estimated at around three, three and a half billion dollars of exports about a billion dollars coming in through state bank uh, declared uh, influx or remittances. And then there are these other remittances which come under just a general category of remittances through freelancers. And then there, is, uh, then there are investments like Ant Financial's investment into Easy Pesa, which is a startup rather than a telco company. So when you add these up, uh, it adds up to about three to $3.5 billion. And um, it's, it's growing very fast. Unlike the other sectors like textiles, this sector is really expanding quickly. So it is the future. Mm. Uh, in so far as products goes, uh, there are some products that are absolutely world class. Um, 
in terms of the rest of the world, Pakistan is not uh, is way behind. Uh, I mean, VC funding, number of products, IT company size. I mean, we we're just reading that Tata uh, is uh, more valuable than the entire Pakistan stock market. It's it's more than 100 billion dollars. So we are way behind. Uh, I mean, there's no contention about that compared to our size and where we should be. But the good news is that we are being, beginning to get our act together. And over the last three, four years, we are expanding aggressively. Mm. And we have, in my mind, all the talent, uh, and we have some infrastructure like the Nadra biometric infrastructure, the 3G, 4G, uh, the, the smartphones, and we need to ramp up our skills uh, training uh, a little bit. Uh, yeah, or, but there's or still room for op optimism right now. Absolutely. Uh, okay. there, there is uh, not only optimism, but realistic optimism. Because if you look at the trajectory of growth over the last three years, there, there is absolutely, uh, I, I am uh, realistically optimistic. Definitely. Yusuf, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your insights. Pleasure. Thank you. With projects like DG Skills underway, we see a lot of potential for the growth of Pakistan's tech industry. However, the question here is, is it going to be enough to compete with the global economy? Thanks for watching. This is Parisa Tarek, and I'll see you again soon.